Okay. So let me just share this. Okay, so now I am recording. Um, so there's, um, so yeah, this trivia here, and then with the, the key, and then this Kahoot game, you just click on it. If you guys want to play it, we can play it after I kind of review the study guide, but you can do it on your own. You guys can play it in teams too. I think like if you start it with, I think there's a way that when you click into it, you can start it with and play it with a few people. Otherwise you can play it on your own. It's kind of weird to play it, a Kahoot by yourself, but in the end you get the material. I mean, it doesn't work like super great, but you can, I think you can do it. But in the end, you'll get, you'll, you'll know the material. So we can either do it as a class if you guys want to, or um, you could just um, set it up and do it on your own or with a group of people, a small group. So there's that. And I think that is, maybe 30 questions. I can't remember how many questions is on that Kahoot. It could be as low as 15 if I'm getting confused with my other one. I can't remember, but we'll find out. We can click on it afterwards. And then here is just a straight sort of content study guide. So there's no questions here. There's, um, it's more like this topic you should be very comfortable with. Like if a question is asked about contrast, you should have brushed up on the difference between high contrast and low contrast, how KVP interacts or how that plays a part with contrast. Um, and so this is really just more like content. So I thought we would just sort of go through this. And if anybody has any questions or is confused about maybe what they're supposed to know, for that section, then we can we can kind of go over that. So final study guide, um, for, be sure to look at each one of these points and write everything that you know about each one. If there's a gap in your knowledge, go into the textbook or PowerPoint to clarify. So basically what I'm saying there is like, don't write stuff that doesn't pertain to it or is some kind of wackadoo offset thing. Like go into the slides and look at like, what's the stuff that's like, what did I want you to know for the quizzes and the exams? Know that same stuff, like stick to, you know, don't make it harder on yourself, stick to what's there um, because it's, it'll probably be what, you know, what's on the exam really. So, um, and then sometimes we, we memorize stuff in a very kind of small way, but then if the question is reversed or if it's applied slightly differently, we don't know how to answer the question anymore. So you want to really be able to explain stuff thoroughly. So go through that exercise again, where you just like explain to a, a friend, like the, what happens with the electrons and, you know, how they move from one part to another and, and, you know, what secondary um, radiation is or, um, you know, or scatter or, you know, kind of like talk through some of those scenarios because um, just answering a multiple choice where you recognize the answer is great and hopefully that'll get you far. But if you know the process, then usually you, if something is asked differently or if it's reversed from how you remember it being asked on the exam previously, you'll be able to still answer it correctly and not, not get thrown off. So um, paralleling technique and bisecting, what is the general description? description of those techniques. When we had those questions on previous exams, people got it wrong because I would try and be tricky. I mean, not really trying to be tricky, but you know, I would say for the paralleling technique, the beam is coming in parallel. Like the tooth and the film are parallel and the primary beam is coming in parallel, true or false. And then that would trip up some people because either just not reading the question slowly enough or just getting the terms confused of parallel and perpendicular. So just be really familiar with those terms. So any primary beam should be coming in perpendicular to something. Like, so if your tooth and your film are parallel for the paralleling technique, your beam has to come in perpendicular or else your beam is going straight up. It, you know, it just wouldn't work. It, it doesn't make sense. So, so um, sometimes it might be just familiarity with the terms. So perpendicular would be the beam coming straight in at a right angle to hit the film and the, uh, the film and the tube. And then for bisecting, you know that the, the, the angle is created by the tooth and the film and the imaginary bisector is in the middle. But again, the primary beam needs to come in perpendicular. So if it says parallel, 
that's not right. That's throwing you off. So it's just trying, you know, sometimes those words are put in there like on purpose to see if you know, you know, the, the technique or not. So just pay attention to those words. Cause that's what I noticed throughout the year of when people got them wrong, it, they just mixed up perpendicular and parallel. Any questions on those techniques at all? I feel like you guys know a lot of this stuff. You guys are doing great. By the way, you guys all have done an excellent job with the life patient. I mean, no need to panic there. Everybody did really good. And if you happen to have a few more retakes than like a classmate, if you talked about it amongst yourselves, usually the people that had a few more retakes had hard patients, like a lot of crowding, narrow palates. You know, there wasn't a lot of bad gaggers. There was, I mean, a few people kind of, you know, everyone kind of like, Ooh, you know, when you get back there, eyes flutter, you know, <laughs> eyes water a little bit, but nobody like couldn't handle it. But, and fast, you guys got done in such a timely manner. Like even in when people like came late or you had to do a few extra things, everyone got done in, you know, plenty of time or within, you know, at least within the time given or much faster than the time given. So you guys have done a really good job. I was telling Holly, I said, I can't wait until they get to be seniors. Cause usually, you know, junior year, you're gonna, you you have, you know, a couple more FMXs to take, but it's so spread out. You only have six patients. And of those six patients, maybe two of them need bite wings. Maybe one of them needs an FMX. Maybe nobody needs a pano. And so your junior year can be weird because you might not feel like you you take enough films. And then all of a sudden your senior year, like everyone's, you need films left and right because you just are seeing way more patients and you might be like, well, I haven't taken, I haven't thought about this for so long, you know, cause maybe it's been like weeks and weeks since you've done it. So just all, you know, always kind of keep brushed up, but you guys have done so well. I, um, I'm thinking you're going to carry that through. Okay. Back to the review. Um, what does the collimator do in regards to x-ray production? So what's the purpose of the collimator? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's re it's helping like reduce radiation because it kind of restricts the beam. Um, it um, helps keep the beam kind of focused and then takes away some, maybe some lower powered um, X-ray beams that would go flying off further as it diffuses. Um, so it kind of helps restrict it and get it down to a smaller size to be more specific to what you need. Um, and thus it's also helps prevent like excess radiation. So it kind of is like a protective measure. It's one of those things in the list of what has helped um, x-rays be less, less radiation with x-rays. Um, placement of sensors. So you just really want to know what you're going for, like literally the teeth that should be in the shot. So, you know, what teeth should be in a molar shot, what, which teeth should be in a premolar shot, and then what's your criteria. And at this point, you guys should be fairly com comfortable with that. What's the main thing you're going for with a molar shot? Centering your second molar, you would like to see the third molar space. Um, and if you center the second molar, that should happen. Um, so that's your that's a big thing with the, what about with the premolar shot? Mm -hmm. Distal of the canine, a lot of times the premolars are centered. Um, and but that's the big thing you that you want to be far enough forward to get the distal of the canine. And then the centering of the second premolars, I've heard in the book, I think it might say that. I've heard Teresa talk about that, and that is a good a good thing to do, but you, you, you don't want to center the second molars and forget about the canine. So it's kind of, you know, you have to, you still have to have that canine in there. And then what about for the canine shot? Center the canine. Center the canine. So it's pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, what's the best way to detect a fusel caries? Visually, clinically. Yeah, so air, you're going to blow air on it. You're going to look. So um, a, a large occlusal caries, you you can see with an x-ray, um, but that's gone pretty far. And so a small occlusal caries or just the beginning, the widening of the grooves and all of that kind of stuff, that you'll, you'll detect that clinically with your eyes. Understand when and why we take, we we retake films in an FMX. So that's just saying like, don't, you don't want to take unnecessary, and this, at this point, you guys, especially after your life patient, this should, this should come pretty naturally to at this point, you just don't want to retake unnecessarily. So we hunt for uh, that, that contact open somewhere, because if you don't have to take it again, you know, you don't want to torture your patient if you don't have to, and you don't want to give them, you know, 
radiation if you don't have to. So you hunt for every open contact somewhere and every apice somewhere. So retakes is really different from um, errors. You know, there, there can be lots of errors, but um, doesn't mean that you'll retake it. Like you might get the cord in the, or, or you might cone cut really bad, but as long as there's di diagnostic information there, you don't have to um, retake it. So you hunt for those retakes based on closed contacts and missing apices. So when it asks you questions in the case studies, it might show you films and say, would you retake this? And so then you just have to ask yourself, well, are all the contacts open enough? And can I see the apices? And if the answer is yes, then that you can see those things, then you would not have to retake it. So it's, a, it's kind of a critical thinking exercise for that. Periapical cysts, what's the structure and content inside a cyst? Epithelial lining. So that's a big key. So with a periapical abscess that might have pus in it or something else, um, it's not going to be lined with epithelial cells, but a cyst, a cyst will. So that's really the big distinguishing thing that you just have to because a cyst can be filled with fluid or, you know, air, could be, could be nothing could be in there. Um, but it's that epithelial lining that kind of distinguishes it. So that's a big take home point for that one. Understand what periapical pathology will appear. Um, hold on, I'm making this bigger. Understand what periapical pathology will appear radiolucent in a radiograph and what pathology appears radiopaque. So I think that's probably... Um, trying to get you to think of like condensing osteitis um, versus periapical abscess um, because it says pathology. So yeah, so I think it's just saying pay attention when you look through that periapical abscess um, slide deck, pay attention to what looks radiolucent, which most of it will look radiolucent and what it looks radiopaque, which mostly it's like the condensing osteitis and then a little bit of the um, the other one that I can't think of the name of. But um, the one that's kind of a mix, it has connective tissue in it. And um, yeah, it's granuloma. I have to pull up the PowerPoint. My brain's not functioning sharp enough. But um, that's essentially what it's, what. so there might be something where it asks a question about, you know, which of these, you know, I can't even think of what the question might be, but I, there must be a question that tests you as to whether or not um, condensing osteitis or something like that would show up radiopaque or radiolucent. So even without being able to look at a picture, you would want to pull up that term and then know if it looks one way or the other, because if it's the multiple choice, I don't know that there's very many pictures attached to the multiple choice questions. So it might all just be descriptive. So you just have to kind of recognize those terms. Um, review and understand x-ray production from start to exposure. So basically that is summarizing saying at any point throughout the, the multiple choice, it could ask you if the anode is positive or if the cathode is positive or, um, what does MA control or, you know, how is it, how is an x-ray, you know, or where where in the tube head is the x-ray actually produced? You know, so it might ask you anything along those lines, but if you have reviewed the, the production of x-rays, then you should be able to answer that, those questions. So just, just kind of go through each step and review that just so you're really um, sure that, you know, you know those, those steps really clearly. Um, so for MA, it's likely gonna talk, I mean, when we talk about MA, it's like, quantity over quality, um, and then also for contrast. So um, does it affect contrast or does it affect density? And then does it affect the number of electrons or the quality of the electrons? So those are the main things for MA is what it's it's gonna want you to know. So, the, so you just go through and remind yourself about what MA really does in an X-ray tube head. It's not going to ask you anything that you haven't seen before on that. And there's only like a handful of things there. And then for KVP, that affects more things. So KVP it can affect density, it can affect contrast, it can affect quality, it can affect quantity. So KVP, it, and then also KVP can relate to like the thickness of the aluminum filter or, you know, there's all these different things for KVP. So that's a, just another good take home point is MA is sort of, it's usually 
like stable. You can't usually change MA and it only really has to do with like a couple things. And then KVP, you can change and it has to do with more things. So just being familiar with that. The other thing with MA, I was just thinking of something as I was talking and then it went away. Um, oh, the step up, step down. That's what I was thinking of. So knowing with step up, step down, you know, which one goes with the MA and which one goes with, and remember you need a lot less energy with the MA. And so it's going to be the step down and you need a lot more energy with the KVP. So it's going to be the step up. So you just kind of go, just go through those things that we have talked about. And the questions are going to be the same kind of thing, just maybe structured slightly different. I was going to wear a Christmas sweater and I forgot because I have one. We had a Christmas. I know. Oh my gosh. Is that Jesus? He's having a party. I was, I couldn't even tell that that's who it was. The first. Yeah. Has anyone seen what? Yeah. It kind of does look like a joint, but I can see it's supposed to be like a, like a blowy, like a party favor. Yes. I had, I have a sparkly, I have a sparkly reindeer and it's, and then it's striped. And I wore it the other night at our faculty Christmas party. And I was like, oh, I'll wear it on Thursday. And then I forgot. And I forgot. I know a lot of stuff in Amazon takes a while to get. I know. Yeah, he's failing. Jeff Bezos is failing. <laughs> Okay, so if you guys have this sheet pulled up and you're making notes, that's probably, I probably should have said that in the beginning, but that's probably helpful. But you can you can go back over this and listen and listen to the things I'm highlighting and then write in the notes. Okay, so what is density? You want to know what density is. It's the overall sort of blackness of the film, right? So Contrast and density can seem very similar. Sometimes you look at a film and it's like, well, what do I say? The contrast is off or the density is off. If the film is just very dark in general, it's just really dark or really washed out, then, then you kind of go along that density line. Like if it's just kind of a washed out film, it's light density, if it's really dark, dark film. And then with contra contrast, we are just specifically talking about those shades of gray. So if you have um, good variation and good shades of gray, then we're talking about, well, the contrast is good. It's um, a low contrast. It has like a little bit of step in between. And then if it's um, if there's not a lot of detail and you just can't see the variation very good, that's hard to detect incipient decay. That just gets kind of washed out. You know, you think of those different things that you'd want to see. Um, that are early, like early signs of disease, those will just get sort of washed out if the um, contrast is high, if it's just really, really light or really dark. You're just not going to see the shades of gray because those are the details that show that the beginnings of, of disease. Oh, did you did I, didn't I? Yes, I did. Okay, <laughs> I did. I did. I did. Right after you said it, I started. Okay. Um, <laughs> Yeah, KVP. Um, so this is a good thing to just maybe talk out. So because um, because it does it it can especially if you know it but you have like forgotten it because it's been a while. I mean this happens to me every year. I have to review it because I'm like, okay, wait, what? And then so the 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 KVP. If your KVP is something very normal, like say your KVP is like you know 65 or something like that, where you're like, well, that's a normal KVP, right? That's not abnormal, but but per this, per the textbook, and per the way we we talk about it, higher KVP is more desirable. It'll give you lower contrast or more shades of gray. So if you get a question that asks you about KVP and contrast, just remember your rule is higher KVP gives you lower contrast, so therefore it'd be more desirable. Even if the numbers seem like not as intuitively. Like you might expect it to say 20 to 100, like something extreme. But if it doesn't, then just remember the rule that higher 
um, KVP gives you a lower contrast, and that's what is more desirable. That will give you a better quality image. Is there going to be like the long? It might ask a question. I don't know for sure, but knowing that the short scale goes with um, high contrast um, because black and white, short scale, there's not very many options there. And then long scale, um, lots of shades of gray. So that's um, low contrast. You see, you got to, sometimes you got to write it down <laughs> in order because it's very, it's like so many opposites and they don't always coincide like logically so you have to like think about it for a minute okay so yeah so density contrast understand the relationship between kvp and contrast high and low we just talked about that um and then remember your buckle object rule so the thing i can say so you guys had a, two questions did you find those questions to be tricky the ones that i yeah, they're pretty, they're not going to be tricky. They're if you remember, if you know what where which um cusps are buckle cusps, so the ones that are lowest to the if there's a film, and I honestly can't remember if there's a film buckle object rule question on the final or if it's just multiple choice. But if there is a film, just look for those landmarks that you know to be buckle. So the lower cusps the ones that are closer to the edge of the film are always your buckle cusps. So if those cusps have shifted and this object, if it's a radio opaque circle, you know, if it's a real film, it could be like a radio opaque thing. It could be like a tattoo, you know, like a piece of amalgam or a piece of a um, instrument tip or just a radio opaque object in the bone or something, you know, who knows what it could be. If it moves, like if one film, you have the, the buckle roots are kind of more like just kind of going down and then all of a sudden the next the the buckle roots kind of look like they've been stretched to the side just notice if that object went with the buckle roots that's the easiest way to kind of just quickly let yourself know is it a buckle object or a lingual object and then if there's other things like the external oblique ridge or if you can see the zygomatic process or something like that that you know is also a buckle landmark you can use that as well so but there will be at least one question on the final, maybe two, I can't remember. Um, and it'll be either multiple, like multiple choice, like the questions from the mini exam, or it, it could be a picture, I suppose. But just keep those cues in mind and you'll be fine. Um, yeah. Say it again. The panel, like the oh, panel, yes, there will be panel landmarks. Um, yeah. It probably actually will be multiple choice. So you'll probably get a picture of a piano and then it'll say, um, it might be pointing to something and probably the either it'll, I can't remember if they're kind of like zoomed in with an arrow or if it's like one panel with lots of arrows, I can't remember, but if it is, you know, like a certain color arrow or something, it might say the blue arrow is pointing to what landmark, and then it'll give you four options. So it'll be even easier than the ones you don't have to handwrite it in. You'll just, your brain will probably remember because, you know, you'll have that visual cue. So there, there is panel landmarks for sure. And I think there's PA landmarks as well, um, but there's more pano, I believe. Mm hmm Um... Okay, so the Frankfurt plane, so just knowing which plane the Frankfurt plane is from the, from the, either under the orbit of the eye to the top of the external auditory meatus, or with the other one, the ala of the nose to like the tragus. So there's those two different, and essentially they're both talking about the same, but I think Frankfurt specifically is from the orbit to the external auditory meatus. That's like specifically the Frankfurt. Um, so just, but just remember that that's the plane that it's on. And then the mid sagittal is down the center. So just knowing that those are the, the planes. Um, in a panel, understand what objects obscure what, for example, air spaces obscure hard tissue. So it's just that one slide that says soft tissue obscures, what is it? Hard, air, hard tissue. <laughs> I don't even remember. I have to look at it. But just remember that uh, a white, like a ghost image, if there's something like metal, that's going to obscure everything and it's going to cause a blur. So on the other end, you know, like on the opposite side. So if you have 
you know, an earring or something like that. On the other side, a little bit higher up and bigger and blurrier, you're going to have something obscuring everything. So you'll have the original, um, the original item, and then you'll have the blurred out ghost image and that's going to obscure everything, but you want to, um, you know, you, and then the air spaces, like you'll have your air space, but then you might see the soft palette in the air space. So the soft, so soft tissue will go over a, an airspace, right? Um, and then, but an airspace will block out hard tissue. So if you have the, the mandible and the ramus, but then the airspace comes down and like cuts out a section of the ramus of, of the mandible. So just kind of think about it, like study a real pano and say, okay, this is what my PowerPoint slide says, but I can actually see it here. And sometimes that helps it stick a little bit better, like actually see what it's doing in the actual piano and that might help those terms you know this obscures that that obscures that um review carries classes and review incipient lesion lesions and arrested decay i will just tell you right now and there's really nothing that can be done with it but there's only a few questions it's not going to make or break your grade but the the carries interpretation is a little bit it's not perfect it, and this is my advice. If you're very confident about knowing, if you're very confident that you know that class one and class two are in the enamel, class three and class four are in the dentin, you should be able to look at it and it, it's clear enough where you should be able to say, this is only in the enamel, this is only in the dentin. So, th th sometimes it gives you an FMX and you have to pull it up and you can make it bigger, but then it kind of looks kind of blurry. It's just not great, but there's only a few questions. And I really honestly believe that you can answer it correctly. Just get your magnifying glasses out. No, but I do think you can answer it correctly. If I thought it was so unfair, it's impossible to answer. We wouldn't even have it on. So I do think it's, it, you can answer it, but you have to know what criteria is what, and then look at it and say, okay, does this clearly, do, can I see that it's in the enamel? Like, and, and that I don't see any shadow. And that should be definitive. Like, I'm not going to give you, I'm not going to be picky. I can't remember if it's graded specific to three or four or one or two. And I'll go back and give points back. If you're at least in the enamel or in the dentin, I would go back and give points. But so you have to be able to know that enough. And then I think you can, you can look at it and, and tell. The other thing is, um, there might be questions about periapical abscesses. And remember, you can see abscesses in all kinds of different areas. So like you can see it on a fully intact tooth and you can also see it in a severely diseased tooth, one that has had like a lot of decay. So, and periapical abscesses can look big or they can look small. The, the, the PDL can just start to widen at the, at the apex. And so, so just, Take your time with these, these images and don't get overly frustrated and just be like, I just can't see, I just can't see it because they're the same images that have been given year after year after year and every, somebody complains. And so that's why I just want to say they're not perfect, but it is, you, it is capable, you will be capable of answering correctly. And if it's, if it's like within the margin, you know, if it asks, you know, class one class, two, I can't remember if it asks like that, or if it just says enamel and dentin then I do give some leeway. So just, I, I always try and make it as fair as possible. Some of you are stressing. Uh, and that says, like, other questions too, if you're not there and we're not in that question, then a lot of us get it wrong because it was like we're confusing. Like, yes. The word something and we just were confused, it, you'll get it back. Yeah. Okay. So in, and I've given this final now enough years that I've weeded out the really, what I feel are the bad questions. Because in the first year, I was like, whoa, that's not a good one. And, and I have done that. So I really feel pretty confident about the questions. But if the whole class just, just doesn't do well because something really truly just isn't set up well, then I throw, I throw them out. So I usually every year I have thrown out a hand, like a few questions, like not a ton, but three, you know, something like that. And then um, you will, uh, is yours a second? Because Mickey knows that her the person that she's going to be there. Yeah. So I'm after Mickey and I don't, I think, I think mine is like third down, but I know, but a lot of times, so who's, who would that be? That would be, I think that's Monica. And she, I mean, she would most well, I mean, 
you know, some of the stuff like the cathode and the anode, nobody wants to remember that unless you have to teach it. So, you know, not, not everyone might, but they may remember enough. Monica's really good. She graduated recent enough that she probably would remember a lot of that stuff and she'd be fine. But, and then Kristen, it, um, Moses is, I think the last one, but I think mine is like the third set of 50. And it was just, I had to take a morning because Monica and, um, Kristen needed afternoon. Otherwise I would have done my, I didn't do it on purpose. Promise. <laughs> Um, but I, I wanted to say that just to give warning, but I also don't want to freak you guys out because I do believe you can answer the questions, um, that are there. I just, I will grant that it's not ideal. Ideal would be you're on a computer in Axiom looking at a picture. That's ideal, but it's just, it just doesn't work out that way. And there's not a ton of them. So, okay. So, but do review the classes. Remember incipient is itsy bitsy tiny whiny and just in the enamel and arrested means um that they had some decalcification they had an incipient caries and then they remineralized it so it's arrested decay it stopped decay so just um be familiar with those kind of terms review filtration are we oh we're good on time right oh yeah okay um review where am i review filtration on the x-ray unit. So the different things, you know, the aluminum filter, the thickness of it, 1.5 versus 2.5 and the KVP difference, like above 70 or below 70 for the um, filtration. Um, what's it made of and how thick does it need to be for the various KVPs? So that's um, just set it right there. It's made of aluminum. And basically if it's above 70, it's Two two and a half, and if it or two point five millimeters, and if it's below, then it's one point five millimeters. And then review Bremsterlong radiation. So you you want to know that Bremsterlong gives you the various different wavelengths, right? Like it comes in and it just sort of angles off at these different these different angles, so that it gives you a a variety of um, wavelengths and strengths for the for the primary beam just gives you a variety where characteristic gives you kind of a consistent um more of a consistent stronger beam because it goes in and actually um knocks out um an electron what's that no i was like did i say it wrong <laughs> did i get it backwards okay <laughs> okay okay good i'm glad we agree It depends. So with characteristic, usually it's the higher KVP. So I used to say one way or the other. I used to say one was more common, but then I went, I was doing some research online and it didn't, I, it kind of, I felt like it contradicted. So I'm not entirely, like, I'm not a hundred percent positive, to be honest. And in the end, it doesn't even matter because you just use the machine that's in there. And I don't think you'll be asked that, that question anyways. Okay. It's just more about like, the, the type of radiation that comes out and the wavelength and the consistency. What's the force did Oh. In our book. And if it is in the textbook, it could be a board question. If it's in the textbook, it's potential to be a board. Um, so what's a sec, uh, what is secondary radiation and when does it occur? So basically secondary radiation is just after the primary beam has hit something, whatever, it's the cheek, the tooth, the whatever it's hit, it's secondary. If it has come in contact with something, then it's, it splits off, it scatters to some degree, and it's become, if, if that photon keeps going, that's secondary radiation. If it becomes like completely absorbed in whatever it came in contact with, then it's kind of done, but if it has continues to live on and do something, um, then it's a secondary radiation. When you use a faster film, so F instead of C or F instead of D, how does that affect exposure time? So they're faster films, you can think of F, and this is traditional, this is obviously talking about traditional, not digital. So um, it's a, if it's a faster, if it's F, it's faster, and if it's faster, it requires less radiation. 
so you can they dial it down so as the years went on before they went to digital they they got these faster films more sensitive films i guess that required less radiation and then it didn't that kind of became a moot point because now we have digital and that's even less radiation but that's the main that's the main thing is exposure time can be less um review the importance uh review importance of source so the source is the x-ray film um and then the the focal spot so wait a minute what but the focal i thought we wait the i thought that I mean, I get what it's saying, like your film is sort of like your target, sort of, but what about the, I thought, you know, the tungsten target inside the machine, we also called it, did we call it a focal something? What did we call it besides the target? I have to look it up on a PowerPoint. That's why I'm like, why is this calling it? Because the film is not, I didn't think the, I feel like I put that in wrong. So, well, let me see what's it trying to say. Review importance of the source film in regards to sharpness and clarity. I think I got them, I think it's, oh, it's backwards. It's, that's what, it is a typo. So it's change this, make a note. So, so the X-ray, where the X-ray comes from, the so is like the source, right? Of your, of your, and the tungsten target, you want it to be a very, you want that, that area that generates radiation or x-ray photons to be very small. So that distance between your film, remember how we kind of played with that? That should be shorter, right? Remember they, that's why you're, or longer, oh my word. Why didn't I review this before I came in? Because we, that should be longer, right? Because you want the, your BID to be longer. Is that what we talked yeah, about? Yeah. Yeah. You guys should know this better than me. You were tested on it. Just because I teach it doesn't mean I know it perfect. Um, so it should be, you have the longer BID. And then for the film tooth, we know that's short. That's easy. That should be close together. Oh, good. Are you helping me? Although focal spot is where it's generated from. X-rays should originate from a small focal spot as possible. The distance between the focal spot and the object should be as long. So the object's the two. But so this this kind of, I think I kind of screwed up on that a little bit. The focal spot is what you're calling the source. The source, which is where the X-rays are generated from. So that distance between that and the tooth would be longer and then your tooth and film shorter. Okay, that helps. Yeah. Most units have a half to 1.5 focal spot, so really super teeny tiny that generates the next week. Okay, that helps me. Thank you very much. Okay, so this is sort of a like, this is a bit of a typo in this sentence here. So review the importance of the source focal spot. So that is, so the source that generates the, the x-rays is also the focal spot. So between that and then the film or in the PowerPoint, it says um, it actually refers to the object, which would be the tooth. So this this is kind of this whole sentence is kind of a little screwy. So um, the source object is longer. That's for better quality. And then the film object or the film and tooth should be closer for better quality. So those are the those are your points that you want to know. And this, so if you cross that out and rewrite it, basically I put focal spot and x-ray. I just, I just wrote it wrong. Okay, so Source and focal spot go together. And, 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 or, and, film and I think you could take out x-ray altogether. I think I was trying to say like your source is your x-ray, which is true. Your, your source is an x-ray beam, but what the question will probably be referring to is, is the source or focal spot, the tiny little tungsten target inside the machine. That's that's all what that's all the same thing. Like the tungsten target is your focal spot, is your source. Like all of those are the same thing. And so it's basically saying that that area of the machine and your film would should be longer distance to get a more clear image. So so you could just cross that out. 
<laughs> all together. Because it's confusing. I just but wrote it wrong. Yeah, it's easy to be longer, but not yeah. longer than them. Yeah. Um, but you need one that's close. Well, yeah, you'd put the BID right up to the cheek, but the BID should be longer. Yeah. So a 16 inch BID is better than an eight inch BID. Okay, good grief. That, I'm going to have to go in and edit that. Next year. Next year. Okay, review step up and step down. Transformers and which one, which ones they control. So just remember, like I, I think I kind of said it, but for MA, you're going from 110 volts from the wall to like, what was it, five to seven or something like that. So it's a, so much lower. So you're stepping down. You, you just, if you think of those numbers and well, 110 is bigger than 100 or three to five. Oh, three to five. I think it's three to five. And, um, so, so that's a step down. And then for KVP, so that's MA. And then for KVP, you're going from 110 to 60,000 or 100,000 or something. So you're stepping up, you're going, you know, and it's always the secondary coils that, that will tell you if you're going to step up or step down. If you have fewer coils on the secondary um, coil, then it's a step down. If you have more coils, it's going to step up. So it's going to ramp it up. So you want to remember that and then review panel errors and the cause. That's pretty straightforward. There's only so many. The person can be turned too far to the right, too far to the left. So their mid-sagittal is not even. They could be chin up or chin down. Their Frankfurt line is not right. So chin up, chin up. They don't put the tongue on the roof of the mouth. That leaves the palatoglossal airspace. They don't close their lips. That makes like a radiolucent kind of like hole right over the anterior teeth. Um, they moved, you know, they, they got their shoulder bumped and they moved their head or something. And then it causes like a little line. Um, what other errors can there be? Oh, ear, yeah. Ghost images. So if they, if you put, um, a thyroid collar, if you grab the wrong lead apron and you put a thyroid collar on them, you're going to have this huge white triangle that'll show up because it'll, um, hit the thyroid collar when it comes around the back, but x-ray beams will go through it or be stopped by it. So if you put on the wrong thyroid, if you put on the wrong lead apron or you leave an earrings or necklace or bobby pins or hair clip, anything like that. So those are your errors. Review penumbra and how it relates to the clarity of radiographs. Just a penumbra is, it, every film has some amount of little fuzziness but you want it minimized. So you don't want a lot of penumbra. And when you have things like, you know, you have the film in the right place, you have the energy, the right, you know, level of KVP, you have the right technique, all these things come together and it helps you have. And then with digital, you can kind of crisp it up a little bit. There's that edge enhance. I know a couple of you, after you took your set, I did control A. And so you guys all, I think you you all, can, I don't think the doctors, it's been back and forth about whether or not the doctors want us to clarify their pictures or not. And I think you can go in and I think we're allowed to do it up to seven and then we can't touch it again after that. But if you do control A, it selects all of your films that you took. And then there on the toolbar, there's an icon that's called edge enhancer and you click on it and it's a drop down and it just has numbers and you go down to seven and it just, crisps it up. So it helps with the penumbra essentially. And it just kind of crisps up the edges. And that's good for seeing whether or not your contact is covered a third or more, because otherwise it can be hard to see. Um, what is ionization? So you want to know this one, I should probably just pull up because I'm like, what exactly do we want to know about ionization? Um, yeah, when it either um, becomes um, like a free radical, or that's probably what it's talking about, not a free radical, but um, when it's unbalanced and it, but let me, um, let me pull up the PowerPoint because I'm not even sure what the question, I don't, I should have reviewed what the questions were for that. If you guys want to, um, let me, it'll take me just a minute to get to this PowerPoint. So if you guys want to take a uh, break, you can, and then we'll, I'll, I'll get this PowerPoint up.
it's the, probably the biological changes one. That's what I was thinking. When it and then it um knocks out an electron. Or in the room. Yeah, ready for a nap, and it's only nine fifteen. That's no good. I did not want to wake up this morning. I was just like laying there, and I was like, Are you "Yeah, everybody." My parents they live in Arizona. They have been so sick. My mom got like, I think she. I really think she had like COVID and flu at the same time. Like I think she had both. She was like on her deathbed, and but she's better now too. But everyone, they've been so cute. And then my in-laws got sick and needed. But she, after Lola had her RSD, and then Sadie kind of just had a bad cold, and then I and I were just sort of like, we are okay, but never like I never like I I felt well enough to come. It's not like I was constantly fighting something off. They say there's like five different viruses going on. So like you could just get like probably from the grocery store yeah. I guess or my dad might he worked part time so maybe he brought it home I don't know I don't know okay we're gonna go on and talk um the review here. So the ionization the on the study guide it's just like what does it say? Like no ionization? Well, there's a lot of components to it. There's a lot of components to it as I pull up the PowerPoint and look at it. I'm like, oh yeah, there was a lot to this. So just you know, understanding kind of the, the basic thing, like how it, it'll just become unbalanced, right? It's not it's not stable anymore. It, it knocks out an electron. So it's it's not stable and it's looking to become stable. And so that's part of the process when the when the photon comes in and knocks out um, when you know whether or not it's from the primary beam or from scatter. 
Um, so the electrons ejected from the shell, creating an ion pair. So the electron that ejects is um, one part. And then the unstable atom. The atom's no longer neutral, becomes chemically active. Um, so just kind of knowing that process there a little bit. And then the next slide. So I'm just going to go through a couple of these slides. Um, so, you know, we know that you can have that excitation, that vibration, and it can settle down or it can vibrate and then break the bond, which is essentially going to give you the same outcome as specifically ionization. So just to kind of re review that, it, basically they give you the same result, which is damaged cells. Um, and so this is kind of just saying the same thing. Once a molecule is kind of damaged, it just doesn't work the same anymore. It's not functioning the same. So you either get a loss of the function or the cell just will eventually die. So it's just negative outcomes, generally speaking, um, after ionization. And so this shows the same thing. It can either um, get that excitation, so that kind of vibration, and maybe it'll calm down, but usually the bonds will break. Um, or the ionization, which is more of the direct hit. So more of the direct hit on an electron making that ion pair. And then um, and then I think what it's really trying to get to is the other point that's probably on the exam is that when this happens, when ionization happens, mostly it's affecting the, the water in our cells, right? Because we're mostly water instead of hitting like DNA or RNA or you know ATP or something like that, it's gonna hit water and um, break up the water molecules in our cells, which still makes a chemical change and still is ultimately bad, but it's different than coming in direct contact with like the life force of a cell, the DNA or the nucleus. So it's just happening in the periphery of the cell and the, like the, what's mostly made up of, not periphery, but you know, most of what's inside of a cell that's not the nucleus. So ionizing radiation um, with a molecule, molecule of water is called radiolysis. So that's probably a good term to remember, radiolysis. And that um, it creates those free radicals. So it goes in there and um, disrupts the water molecules, making some like hydrogen peroxide type molecules or just, just hydrogens. And, and then they come together, I guess, and create hydrogen peroxide. So I guess I'm a step ahead. But the hydroxyl or the hydrogen... And then everything's just trying to kind of come together and form a stable molecule, but some of those stable molecules are not good for our bodies. And so that's just the end result of what happens. Um, so this is just showing that again, the, the x-rays hitting more of the waters inside of our cells, that's the ionization is it sort of breaking those molecules up, causing ion pairs, and then they'll recombine to form some kind of a stable molecule, but that stable molecule is not very good for us. So, so it might, it'll eventually probably end up in some cell death. Of course, when we take, when, when we're talking about this for a dental x-ray, we're talking about such a tiny amount of tissue and cells, it's negligible for our health. It's not like that is going to kill us or cause cancer, but that process in a large amount or frequently is not healthy. So, um, so I don't, specifically remember what type of questions are around this, but I think you you can imagine there, there might be some questions that um, are mocked up in the Kahoot or in the, um, the trivia game. And then you can also think back to like how questions were posed in the, in the old exams too. So I think that's pretty much when it says be familiar with ionization, I think that's good to just review that process. Okay, so I'm going to minimize this and we'll see what was next. A lot. Mm -hmm. Was it about ionization? About, yeah, like two rapids and like direct and direct. I think a lot of people. Oh, yeah, it was direct. But it was like the three rapids. Let me, um, so that would have been quiz, that would have been like quiz three. It was pretty early, like quiz two or three. Well, let me, let's, we'll go through this here and then I'll look. Look at, yeah, if you tell me which quiz it is, I can look it up over here and see. Um, okay, review focal trough and how it affects the anterior teeth. So you, you know that one thing I think you guys probably, like it started coming together when you actually did your 
um, panel proficiency was remember the little bite stick that your patient bites on and how there's those little, there's four little places that you can put the bite stick. That is all within the focal trough. So like, that's like taking like this kind of knowledge, like the term focal trough, whatever, but then you actually are using the machine and like, does it matter where I put this? This little stick. Well, yes, it does, because you want it to. You want to stay in the focal trough for for the patient, because and that's why you line up for our machine. And every machine might be a little bit different, but for this machine, you line up that that line, um, the vertical line between the lateral and the canine, and so you put them in. That helps them be in the right place in the focal trough, because you don't want them to be too far forward. You don't want them to be too far back, or else their anterior teeth will either kind of blur out or get tiny. So that's how the focal trough affects. And if they're out of the focal trough, it, you might lose some of the condyle or something. It was prostate. Okay, we'll take a peek at that in a second. Um, review how frequency and wavelengths are related to photons. So the higher the frequency and the shorter the wavelength, the more powerful the X-ray photon is. So when you have, you know, just make a squiggly line, and when you when your little humps are really close together, that's and that's a higher frequency and the distance between the peaks are closer together, that's shorter wavelengths. And that just creates a stronger, a stronger X-ray photon. And so if it's, you know, if it's long and lazy, it's a weaker, uh, um, <gasps> yes. Okay, I am recording again. Sorry. It's a weaker X-ray photon. Um, review cell damage by ionizing radiation. What predominantly causes biological damage? We talked about that predominantly. It's radiolysis is going to be the main thing um, because, um, and it's going to be more indirect hits, right? Because you're going to hit more of the water molecules. It'll cause these kind of toxins, which will cause the damage. So that's more of an indirect hit than a direct hit to like the DNA. Um, review what is referred to as somatic effect as opposed to genetic effect. Basically somatic is, is anything that hits any part of the body or causes damage anywhere that's not genetic material or reproductive material. If it, if it causes damage to reproductive material, then you see the results in the next generation. If it's um, you know like breast cancer and you're radiating that area, they'll have effects on their body right then. Whereas if it's, you know, the ovaries, it'll affect the next generation. So somatic is any tissue that's not reproductive. And then direct effect and indirect effect, effect. So direct is going straight to the, the heart of the nucleus, the, you know, the, the RNA, the DNA of the cell, whereas indirect would be um, damaging the cell, but not hitting the the mainframe, the, the main center and causing like the radiolysis and the damage through a multi-step process as opposed to just going right in and damaging the DNA. What is chemical of life? So that chemical of life is like our class term for like DNA. Okay. So anything that's in the nucleus is the chemical of life. Mm -hmm. And then everything else is water. Yeah. And then they water. It causes the radiolysis. Mm -hmm. Direct. Mm -hmm. Say it again. That was a question. Do you or yeah. So that's going to happen more often. Yeah. So it's it's a question of frequency. Both of them will definitely cause biologic damage. But there, it's if it's a question of frequency, radiolysis or indirect hits will be will happen more frequently. I have yeah. uh, both are dense molecule, uh, infrequent direct, molecule, indirect. Yes. Yep. Let yeah, so but less less frequent, easier. quicker. It would be more damaging faster, yeah. but not necessarily more damaging overall. So it's like a slow process of death, <laughs> as opposed to as opposed to a quick process of death. So direct hits go to the you know that'd be like an arrow through the heart, 
Whereas an indirect hit would be, you know, a slow bleeding leg wound <laughs> where you slowly bleed out. <laughs> That's depressing. Um, so if, when it says that, when the, when it says here, the predominantly causes, that's probably not great verbiage. It's really talking about frequency, not like, yeah, it's talking more about frequency of which, what happens more often. Alara is, um, as low as reasonably achievable. Um, and that it, that is talking about the intervals. So remember, it all has to do with your patient's risk. If in general, in general, this is a, a basic rule of thumb and the assistants have, the, if you've worked in dentistry, this is familiar, but you have to think about it. You might be tested on it slightly different. So like basic rule of thumb, patients get x-rays once a year. You get your FMX every three to five years. Those are like bite wings once a year. And if it's kids, sometimes it's every six months, but that just depends on the practice. Those are general rules of thumb. And then there are but for our perspective, it's like, what does the patient actually need? So if you have a patient that has a 12 month um, set of bite wings, but they've never had a cavity in their life, you know, you could easily stretch that out. They could go theoretically, was it 24 or 36? They could, so they could theoretically go up to three years if they've never had a cavity in their life and they're an adult, not a kid. Kids are a little bit different because kids are prone to caries more. But if they're like 25 years old and they've never had a cavity ever, you know, or even bump them up even more if they're 30, you know, even more stable in life, you know, like then um, they, they, you wouldn't necessarily have to do it every 12. So w in school, we think about things of, as what is their risk level? Do they have dry mouth? Do they take meds? Do they drink um, a lot of soda or snack frequently? Um, is there, you know, another medication that is, increases their risk for some reason? Do they have a systemic disease that increases their risk that causes dry mouth? There's lots of them that do that. Um, have they had radiation in the head and neck and that's damaged their salivary glands? So there's so many things to think about that changes their risk. And so you might go from one person, you know, your basic like every 12 month x-rays might go 12, you know, 24 months, 36 months, or you might have an adult that needs them every six months because they're always getting new cavities. So it just depends. It's so that's what the principle of Alara is, is based it on their risk assessment within sort of a window of a couple of years. If you review that prescript and the prescription, I think it's up in the general section or is it in one of the weeks? I can't remember now. Um, if you need to just review that, um, I'm just going to look. Oh, guidelines for prescribing radiographs. It's in the very top general section up at the very top of Moodle and it's a PDF. So you can, um, I don't honestly remember how many, if there's varies for each individual, what is their risk? I, it could be that you'll be asked a very general question. Like this person, um, ha has a new cavity every time they come in, you know, what, what type of x-rays would you um, prescribe? The other thing you want to think about is, you know, like if they're perio, you'd make, give them vertical bite wings. So it's all, this is kind of falls into the clinical critical thinking kind of questions that you might get. So um, look at the form, but just remember that in general, what your, the take home point is, it's not just a rubber stamp for everybody. It's based on their risk. Some people will need more. Some people will need less. Um, and so that's it for, I guess, the just that'll all be in like the multiple choice question section. And then for case studies, it's it could ask you. So your case studies will look like this. You'll, you'll have a PDF that you keep pulling up. And in the PDF, it will have a narrative. It'll have like their medical history, their medications. Um, systemic diseases they have, like some, maybe some dental history. So there'll be a narrative that you read through and then there'll be maybe a set of bite wings, maybe an FMX, and then maybe um, a perio chart and then maybe intraoral pictures. So there, and it, you might not have all of that for everyone. I can't remember, but you, you'll you have what you need to answer the questions. And so then it'll say like case one, it'll say questions one through 24 
all pertain to case one. And so you can keep <clears throat> clicking on the PDF of case one and looking at it. And then some of the questions will bring some of those details into the body of the question. So you don't have to keep referring to it. If, but if you want to refer back to it, then you certainly can. You, it'll just be available to you on your screen. You can always click on it and bring it down. And so you might have, um, there might be an FMX and then maybe for one of the questions, they took a section out of the FMX and they like mismounted it. And so then it'll ask you a mounting question. So it'll ask you like, or it might take a section out of that FMX, like maybe it'll take a premolar shot and say, does this film need to be retaken? And then you'll notice, well, is there distal of the canine there or is the tooth centered or whatever? So it uh, the case questions for radiology will be kind of different than the other ones, I think. I mean, maybe not. I don't really know what the other questions focus on, but that's how the case, that's the kind of questions you'll get. So proper mounting, um, need to know if the <clears throat> know if a film is in the correct orientation, like is it upside down, is it flipped, you know, something like that. Um, landmarks both on PA but more on pano. So, so look, you know, review several panos and look at all the different landmarks that we talked about for pano. Um, perio interpretation, it's going to give you a, a, an FMX and say, is perio present? And just to give your best guess, it's, it's, it's going to be challenging because it's, it's, you know, you can't blow it up and get the super crisp, you know, it's not ideal, like I said, but it should be, it should be easy enough to say whether you're looking at a one, two versus a, or, or actually it should just be easy enough to say whether it's present or not. Cause I think that's what it, I'm not sure if it even asks stages. It might just say, is it just present? Like it's perio there. And, and it should be obvious enough to be able to give a good educated guess if you're looking at some bone loss. <clears throat> Terry's interpretation is the same thing. I kind of gave you that um, spiel already. And then localization, buccal object rule, given two films, can you tell if an object is buccal or lingual? So just pay attention to those buccal landmarks. And um, and if the if the buccal cusps have moved, you know, compare that from one film to the other. That's that's a really easy one to remember, but if there's other landmarks in there, utilize those as well. And then dental materials, there could be you know, uh, those tricky ones that we had last time, like the silver points and the pins and the posts, those weird and gutta percha, the things that like we don't really deal with, like we're not endodontists and we're not dentists and we don't put those things in, but those could be on, that could be in somebody's FMX. And so it could ask questions about that. Different kinds of crowns, the gold. So if it's gold, it's just going to be solid white. If it's a PFM, you'll um, see the core, you kind of see the two tones a little bit, the, the porcelain built up over the, the metal. So you kind of see a little bit of both. Um, if it's a zirconia or a ceramic, it, it sometimes looks a little transparent when you don't see any metal. So those different stainless steel kind of has like more of like almost a see-through metal appearance. So you have, um, you have all those different types. So just review dental materials. And then critiquing for retakes, especially. So, you know, it might ask a question like, is there horizontal angulation? Just remember if this crosses over at all any, then just yes. And um, I know we have the one thing where if it's a canine shot, we don't really think about the horizontal angulation distal to the canine. I don't think the questions are going to get that specific. So in general, if, if it's there, it's there. If there's horizontal angulation, it's there, right? Um, but I think more it's going to quiz you on supplemental and retake. So, you know, if you've met the criteria, if you've put the film in the best place that you could possibly have ever put it, if you've centered the second molar and you still don't have some of the third molar, it becomes a supplemental film. So you don't, you don't get a ding for it. And that matters when you guys are in clinic because you can only have next semester when you take your FMXs in clinic, you can only have five retakes and if you have more than five retakes on an FMX, you don't get to count that FMX. So you took the FMX and you keep seeing your patient, but you don't get to count it towards your requirements. So you want to go for less than five. And then your fall um, senior year, it goes down to four. And then your senior spring, it goes down to three. So by the time you're um, in your last semester, you can only get three retakes on an FMX. And for bite wings, it goes down even more. It like, you know, there's only four bite wings. So, so that's, so supplementals are like, 
you maybe have to take the picture again, but it doesn't ding against your grade, which is you know what you would want. So, and then uh, so when is a retake required, and when is a supplemental film required? Already so that, and then identifying error in positions, horizontal, vertical, and beam centering. So all your so I guess maybe it, there are going to be questions about error. So just being able to tell if, if there's a cone cut or a beam centering error, if it looks significantly foreshortened or elongated, there might be questions on that. And I know that can be tricky. So hopefully it's a, they're pretty clear. Just remember if you see that separation cusp in a nice parallel shot, the buccal and lingual cusps are superimposed and, and you can't really see the difference, maybe just a tiny bit. But if there's a lot of vertical angulation, you start to see the buccal and the lingual cusps go on different planes. So that kind of is a, as a, a hint that there's vertically. And you really, honestly, you see it all the time because it's very hard, unless somebody has a very broad, deep palette, it's very hard to get a good parallel shot, especially on the maxilla. You guys might've noticed that in your live patient experience because the palette does this, right? And the teeth might be more like this, but the palette does this and you just can't get parallel to the tooth very good because of the shape of the palette. So a lot of times you end up with some vertical angulation. So, oh, and the other thing too, I was thinking was, um, well, and this is just something I talked with um, one of the other faculty about, but if anyone was, I don't think I ever really clarified that the, um, that the, pay, the life patient is just an experience. I think it was a little murky whether or not that was like graded, but I think that they call it the life patient experience because it is an experience. So, so people were throughout the week, some people would be like, what if we fail? What happens if we fail? And, it's, and I guess I was talking with one of the other faculty because I was like, what happens if they fail? Because <laughs> so far nobody's failed. And, um, and she's like, well, they, they don't fail. It's just an experience. I was like, oh. I don't think I really realized that myself. So after it's all said and done, I share that bit of news with you. So anyway, so any questions so far? Do you guys feel? Oh, yes. If you fail, then you're kicked out. No. If you fail the, if you fail the final, um, well, because remember, you guys, if, if you see a grade, I don't even know for sure if you see a grade when you're done. I don't know if you do. Um, don't think that much about it because that grade is, is, doesn't mean anything because you might have, you know, what matters is I take my hundred questions and um, I tally up the hundred questions and then everyone gets a half a point per question. And so, and so, you know, I just, I just take the questions that matter to me. So you might've gotten more or less wrong um, for radiology. So the, your total grade doesn't matter. And it also doesn't, it's not any more points than your other exam. So really like a lot of times you can, if you have done, you can look at your grade up until a certain point. If you've done, you know, fairly well, strong enough, then you can kind of see, you can see what you can get. Like you can actually project because here, I'll show you real quick because we're almost out of time, but I'll just show you here. If you look at the syllabus, if you can you can you can literally look and see what you can get for for a, your different classes you can look and see what um what grade you can get so see here how it says the point system the total points for this class is 260 you've all passed lab you all it's a it's a it's a pass or fail for lab you've all passed lab so don't worry about that um, that just goes in automatically. Um, and then for, for the didactic portion, there's 260. In order to get an A, you have to get 239.2, because yes, we have to use a decimal point because it, I mean, otherwise you have to draw a line somewhere in the sand or else it's like, you just be constantly rounding everyone up and giving everyone an A. So you have to get 239.2 points in order to get an A. And then in order to get a B, you have to get 213.2 points. So you can go into Moodle and see how many points you've accrued up to this point. And then your final is 50 points. And so then just, and remember it's 50 points, but there's a hundred questions. So you just will just double whatever you, you get for how many you can miss. 
So then that can, you can say, that's how many questions I can miss on the final that, or this is the grade I need to get to keep a B, or this is the grade I need to get an A. If you're right, if you're close, like if you're hovering between a B plus and an A, or this is the grade I need to keep an A, if you have an A or whatever it is. So you can literally like do this with every class because I, everyone's syllabus should be somewhat similar and you can figure out this point system. If you dip below a 75 in the class, um, generally what happens is you, um, you have to, and it sounds really super scary, but you go in front of the standards um, committee of standards and appeals committee or something, which is just three faculty members that don't teach the course that you didn't pass. And they will just look at your record. And if they see that you've done well, but maybe, you know, maybe struggled a little bit, then they'll, um, they, it's a, it is an endless possibility of what they can do. What they don't do is just kick you out. I, that's just not like the first, well, you're done. Sorry. That's not what they do. That, that takes a lot of things and a record of a lot of things. I mean, that's not just one you know, troublesome spot. It might be like an extra assignment or another exam or something like that. Then you should still be, yeah, and you can figure that out. Like, let's say your, let's say your grade currently is like, if you look in Moodle, your grade technically an A and you look at how many points you have, like, let's say you have 240 points right now. I don't know that that's possible. No, that's not possible. <laughs> No, I don't have to do math on the, you can figure this out or come to my office. Yes. No, yeah. If you like don't pass the final, but you still have enough points to pass the class, you lucked out. <laughs> and you can figure that out. Like you can figure it out. Like you can look and go, I can afford to get 70 on the final. Okay, and so you you can figure that out. Like you can look at the points you have now, how many you need, and then you can. And if you need help, you can stop by my office, and I can help you figure it out. Okay, that's it. I'm done.